Yo, what is up, everybody? This is Matt Druin, host of Go Big Live Real Estate Investors Podcast. I am psyched out of my mind to have very special guests with me today, Mr. Tyler Cobble. He was another one of my victims. I hunted down at BP Con in Orlando <laughs> this year. It was him, Antonio Cuccinello, and Rich Fetke were like the three on my target list there. So he graciously accepted my invite. I probably put him on the spot. So sorry to have made you feel uncomfortable, but... A little bit about Tyler is that he is based in Nashville, Tennessee, has probably involved in the city's development through renovation projects and volunteer work. Under Hamilton Development, Tyler has acquired over 2.1 million square feet of commercial property since 2019, ranging from retail and office to hospitality and industrial. And this doesn't even scratch the surface of Tyler's passion for coaching and his best-selling book, Open for Business, The Insider's Guide to Leasing Commercial Real Estate. Welcome to the show, Tyler. I appreciate it, man. Matt, excited to be here. Glad you uh, grabbed me at BPCon. That was a fun event, man. I had a good time there. As well. It was my first one. So I made a lot of great connections, include, including you. And also I was able to meet some of the people I had on the podcast that had only been able to meet via Zoom, like Brian Burke and Matt Faircloth. I was able to like get belly to belly with them for the first time too. So that was awesome. I am going to start out with our first question to all our guests. You were born, now you're here. What happened in between? Yeah. So grew up in Nashville, Tennessee. Didn't make it too far. Obviously I'm still here today. Went to you know a couple of different private schools here in Nashville. I was very fortunate to have a family that could do that for me. and But I was never really a good student. I always worked really hard in the summers and knew that I wanted to work as quickly as I could. Grew up working in construction for my grandfather. He had his own company that he founded in 1972. So I was, you know, I was 175 pounds when I was in eighth grade. So I was a big guy. And they always just gave me the sledgehammer and said, tear things out. So... <laughs> That's that's what I got to do. I learned very quickly that general labor is not going to be a very fun lifestyle for the long haul. So as soon as I graduated high school, I got into sales. And that summer ended up making about $30,000 doing sales before I went off to the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. And, you know, for a 19 year old kid, $30,000 might as well be a million. That's, wow. I'd never seen anything <laughs> like that before. And started daydreaming in class. And I was taking classes I'd already taken in like eighth and ninth grade. I don't understand why they have those general requirements for you in college. And of course, got bored. And so I was thinking I made $30,000 over three months in the summer. If I was working full time, that's $120,000 a year. What the hell am I doing in college? So I dropped out after my freshman year, much to the chagrin of my entire family. Nobody was very <laughs> excited about that one and immediately got to work. So I started off working for my grandfather in construction again, this time as a project manager. And about three months into that, a commercial real estate developer that I had sold to in my previous job found out that I was back in town and he was like, hey, you're really good at sales. I want you to come work for me. So he paid for me to get my real estate license. I started off as the in-house leasing agent for that boutique development firm. And working on their, you know, re office retail and industrial portfolio. But the best part about it was I got to have the inside track on how commercial real estate development works. So I got to sit in on all of the development meetings every week and did so for about two years before I put together my first project. This was back in 2015, 2016, which was a 42 unit townhome development about 15 minutes southwest of downtown Nashville. Finished that project up, left, and started my own thing in 2018. So I started the, the Cobble Group, which is my commercial real estate brokerage. Still have that team today. I've got seven brokers that work for me now. So I'm a little bit more hands-off on the brokerage side, though I'm still running the company. I started Parasol Property Management that year as well, which now manages, gosh, I, I'm going to have to run the numbers, but a little over 2.1 million square feet because we mostly ma self-manage, but we do some third party as well. Mm -hmm. And then in 2020, I started my development firm. So we'd been raising capital and syndicating deals in tw as early as 2019, but I didn't need a team up until we had acquired about four or five buildings, properties. And then I was like, you know what? I'm working too much. I got to bring some other people in to help me out here. So I officially founded the company. Since then, we've acquired over $50 million in assets, done close to $100 million in development. And uh, yeah, got started in YouTube in 2020 of all things, which was really out of boredom. I had no, literally nothing else to do. I was so used to being out of the office all day. I was stuck in the office all day then and started thinking, you know what? Let's just start the YouTube 
channel. I've, I've been thinking about doing that for a little while. And here we are, you know, four years and 400 something videos later. It's been a lot of fun and I really enjoy that. Absolutely, man. So we wanted to discuss a case study to pick on for this show. That one big deal that you did that was like, you were kind of uncomfortable, weren't sure where you're going to get the dough from uh, that sort of that first big like that going big moment is kind of like the theme to our show. So would you want to t like pick as the case study today? And like, what was the origin of that deal? What was the seminal, mo seminal moment of, yeah, I can do this. Yeah, I, I've done it for somebody else. I can do it myself. And just tell me about the, that story. Yeah. So when I first got started, you know, we acquired a few buildings. None of them were huge. I was never really scared of anything like that. But in 2020, when everybody else was running away, I was like, there's going to be opportunity out there. Let's go find it. So I ended up putting a an $18 million shopping center under contract, <laughs> which was to put it in perspective at the time, it was my biggest acquisition by about 9x. Mm -hmm. So way bigger than I had any business dealing with, but I found it off market. I was looking at it. We could buy it. It's 330,000 square feet, 32 acres, buy it for 18 million. But if we brought enough equity to the table, it would cash flow day one. Mm -hmm. And the land was fully entitled for high density development. So like I said, it had 330K square feet existing, mm -hmm. which it still has today. Uh, but it's entitled for one and a half to 2 million square feet. Wow. So I knew just based on the price per square foot of the dirt alone, it was an absolute steal and I couldn't let this opportunity go by. So put it under contract. I had to put down $180,000 of earnest money which I did not have. So <laughs> I called one of my investors, borrowed $180,000 from him to put the earnest money up. And we started off on the due diligence. This shopping center had been owned by the family for probably 30 years. Records were not very good. So <laughs> my attorneys were having a field day trying to figure out what was going on in the leases. We couldn't get a straight rent roll pulled together. But again, we knew it was a deal just based on the dirt. While all that was going on, I was out trying to find a partner. And I talked to everyone in the world that I could get a hold of. Most people were at home. It was a pandemic, even though this was probably, it, it was really like August to December of 2020 was when we were working on this. And it was tough. I mean, it was a big deal. It was the wrong side of the river for Nashville. Mm -hmm. But if it was on the right side of the river, it would have cost five times this amount. So I knew that there was some value there. It was still closer to downtown than a lot of the really high-end areas. It was 15 minutes of downtown. And it was cash flowing, day one. Mm -hmm. So went through numerous capital partners, ended up finding a group out of Texas that, that I partnered with. I mean, I remember being on the phone, you know, New Year's Eve at like 10 or 11 o'clock at night, <laughs> trying to get this deal wrapped up, trying to get it extended. And I literally came within about an hour of losing three to four hundred thousand dollars of money that I didn't have. So you can imagine what I'm sitting at home doing while <laughs> everybody else is out partying for New Year's Eve. I'm sitting here trying to make sure that this deal gets pulled together. And you can you can bet yourself that I went out and celebrated pretty hard after I got off that phone call. So they agreed to the terms of the deal. We got everything structured. We closed in April. And it's been a home run of a deal ever since, but it's the deal that I kind of refer back to of like, I, I had a tiger by the tail. I had no idea what I was going to do. Uh, I could have lost everything easily multiple times, but the biggest thing was that I just stuck with it, kept working on it, didn't give up. And, you know, it was one of the last capital partners that I talked to that ended up being the one to move forward with. Excellent. Awesome story. Let's back up a little bit. You were prospecting for off-market deals. Tell me about your specific process associated with that. Was this a property like you drove by, you saw maybe like a janky for a lease sign or something like that in front of the plaza? Like, tell me about wh like where this come from? How'd you prospect specifically in terms of like getting in contact with the owner and all of that stuff? Yeah. So it goes back a little bit further. So I was actually working on a property around the corner that was almost equivalent in size. It was about a four to 500,000 square foot property, also on 32 acres, but didn't have the zoning. It was going to have to get rezoned. Mm -hmm. And I had been negotiating with that seller for probably six months. And we had a deal no less than six or seven times. Mm -hmm. We would agree to the terms. I'd go sit down with him. He was 90 years old at the time. 
And I think that he just really enjoyed having somebody to talk to and pretend like he was doing deals. Cause every time we would <laughs> sit down to sign the contract, he would go, you know what, actually, I want to change this up. Let's take this building out. I'm going to hold on to that one for a little bit. And I just want to sell this building. Mm-hmm. And we'd sit there. I go, okay, let me run the numbers. We'll figure that out. Mm-hmm. Then I'd send everything back over to him. He'd say, okay, that works. Come into the office and we'll sign it. And it, I mean, this the process repeated. <laughs> and I couldn't figure out what was going on. I, maybe he didn't believe that I could actually close on it, which to be fair, I hadn't closed on anything <laughs> like that before. So uh, after the seventh time, I got unbelievably frustrated. I was like, you know what? I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm going to go find something else. And there was a similar size site around the corner that had been listed for a little while at $35 million dollars. And it was way overpriced. Being a broker, I knew exactly how to evaluate the property. And so I looked up the ownership and I was like, oh, that's funny. I played football with this guy back in high school. His dad had been a a really big commercial real estate investor in Nashville. And so I called him and I said, hey, obviously you guys know you're never going to get $35 million for it. That's why you took it off the property, the the market. Mm -hmm. You know, what would you guys realistically take for it? He was like, oh, we're probably in the 20 to $22 million range. And so mm-hmm. I was like, okay, let me see what I can pull together. So I sent over an offer for $17 million. They counted at 20 I counted at 18 and they ended up accepting it. So I, that's kind of how we found it. I, I just looked at the property owners, realized it was somebody that I knew. That's the benefit of doing real estate in a market that you've grown up in. Chances are pretty good. You've got connections with somebody somehow. And I'm a big believer that real estate is not always about what you know, though that certainly helps. It's a lot about who you know, because I don't know if Tom hadn't been one of the partners on that deal, I don't know that we ever would have been able to get it under contract. Yeah, I want to dive in a little bit to, I'm always like in this, you know, thinking about kismet and how the universe works in your favor. Do you think that if this 90 year old guy didn't waste all this time and you didn't get so pissed off that like maybe you wouldn't have had the frustration to fuel, like, I got to find something else. What do you think about that? Oh, man, I love it. I love having a chip on my shoulder. Uh, you you got to have it because it, it gets you out of bed in the morning and there's nothing like being a little angry and trying to prove people wrong. I mean, I, I, I woke up every morning thinking that guy doesn't think that I could close on a deal this size. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's why I started looking at properties nearby because I knew if I was able to pull it off, he would know it. It'd be in the new, but it was a big story because that property had, it used to be at one point, the one that we bought was like the shopping center to go to back in the 1960s. That's where you did your going to town shopping and all that kind of stuff. So it was a big deal. And so I kind of let that motivate me for a little while. If like, yeah, I can't wait for him to wake up and read the paper one day because he still reads the paper and <laughs> see us on the front page for closing on this one. Absolutely. I love it. I mean, I'm over... <laughs> Overall, I'm a positive person, but it's like that negative stuff that happens to me that's act, like absolutely rocket fuel for pushing myself forward. And I keep that front and center and I think about it constantly because there's a lot of bad stuff that's happened in my life. And a lot of people can like lead to, you know, like doing self destructive behavior. But I just, it's like that dark energy rocket fuel that I just love that part of the story. So going forward, I, look, a little bit, I, yeah. But before we go forward, I mean, I want to interject into that. I completely agree. Right. Like, I think that it it is the most helpful thing. Look, you can either be hateful or grateful. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's a very negative side of that, that if you let it just totally consume you, it it takes you down a darker path. But if you're grateful for people giving you that that motivation, like, man, what can you go achieve with that? I love it. Mm -hmm. So going forward a little bit. 180,000 bucks, like you got this maybe in the form of a promissory note from somebody you knew, like, where did that relationship come from? And how did that ask like come about like specifically? Yeah, it wasn't even a promissory note. It was just a, an investor that I had done some deals with that knew, liked and trusted me. And I mean, we didn't have, I don't even think we had anything in writing. He just said, all right, here's the 180 grand. I know you're good for it. That's a lot of risk on his part. But I would never let him down. I mean, if that deal had fallen apart, I would have found a way to pay him back because that wasn't what he signed up for. Even though there's a lot of people that would have just walked away and said, yeah, sorry, I lost your money. You know, it was a risk. You took it, whatever. But I don't play that way. I'm going to be in commercial real estate for the next 50 years, hopefully. And I want to build a good track record of that. And and it paid back tenfold, right? Because he's been an investor in my deals ever since. Because I mean, I, I think there was a part of him too that was like, there's no way you're going to pull this off. Let's see what you do with it. <laughs> So let's back up. Like, where did that relationship come from? I mean, he did, he had 
done some business with you before. I mean, because this is, the reason why I kind of harp on this and like want to extract the excruciating detail out of this is that people don't really appreciate that it's like those seed investors you first start with that are just like, that basically help you build that foundation and help you build capital in the future. So I want to go back to that story. Yeah, absolutely. So I met him through an attorney that I was working with quite a bit at the time who saw the way that we were putting deals together and knew that I was out there busting my ass to pull it off. And so he said, Hey, you've got to, you've got to meet this other client of mine. And so we all went out for beers one night and just got to know each other a little bit better. And this investor was incredibly successful. He had been in a completely different industry before he started investing in real estate and was still kind of involved in that industry. So he was raising capital from all of his friends that were mm-hmm. on that side of things uh, to run these real estate investments. But at the same time, he'd have to be out of town for six plus months out of the year. Wow. And so initially, our conversation started off with, hey, I know how to develop projects and run real estate deals. Why don't you just let me come in and I'll run these for you, you know, while you're gone. And, you know, you either just give me a small part of the partnership or you pay me a fee. Either way, happy to do it. And so it kind of just evolved from there of, you know, us finding synergistic ways to work together and then doing deals together. Excellent. Yeah. So it came from the standpoint of wanting to like recognizing that there may be a problem that you might be able to step in and create value through solving that problem for somebody else. Is that kind of like the the nature of this whole thing? That's right. I mean, I've always been able to look at deals much more creatively for whatever reason than other real estate investors for the most part. And so I was able to solve some problems for him that were kind of out of the box. And So because of that, he just started trusting me more and more. And then he kind of started looking at me more as almost an advisor in some cases of like, hey, what would you do here? And, you know, when you can, like, especially when you don't have the money, which is how I was when I was first getting started out, I didn't have anything, right? I was a commercial real estate broker hoping I was going to get my next commission check, which I don't know if that's (laughs) going to be tomorrow or in six months. That's the unfortunate part about being in commercial real estate. When you can prove that you know what you're talking about and you can execute on it, that is unbelievably valuable to the people that have all the money because they don't want to execute on it, right? They want to just put the money to work, right? And they've done all the work physically themselves uh, (laughs) over the years. And that's how they've gotten to the point where they are. And and now they're ready to kind of pass the baton, so to speak, and collect more passive income. And so that's kind of where he was. I want to go back a little bit on this too. So because you, you kind of answered it, but I just want to make it very clear for people listening. Was this something that he just asked you to help him with? Or was this something where through listening and watching, you were like, all right, I can help this guy someplace and he doesn't, and he doesn't even have to ask me about it. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, I'm I'm always looking for that angle of like, what can I do for this person? How can we work together? How can I make their life easier? Right. Because I mean, that comes from the commercial real estate broker in me, right? You're always trying to find ways to build a relationship with someone. Mm -hmm. And the first thing you're doing when you're cold calling in commercial real estate, you don't want to just cold call and and straight up ask for a sale. You want to Mm -hmm. bring something of value to the table that's going to make that person want to answer your phone call every time you call them. Mm -hmm. So first, early on in my career, it started off with, hey, John, I wanted to give you a call. I sold this property down the street from your building. We sold it for, you know, $220 a square foot, which would basically value your property at $10.2 $10.2 million. I uh, would love to talk to you if you need any leasing or, or if you'd be interested in selling your property. You know, let's talk about it. And, you know, they'll probably be like, oh, no, I'm not interested in selling at this time. But you slowly just build up that relationship and you keep giving them more information. Of course, you know, they're going to want to talk to you because every time you're talking to them, you're giving them something of value. And so that's just kind of how I've always operated. I mean, people in commercial real estate are very busy. There's a lot of plates up in the air spinning around. And it's really tough to take your focus off of something else. So if you can bring some sort of value to them, they will find a way to make the time to have conversations with you, to walk through a property with you. So I've just always kind of led with that. What kind of value can I bring? How can I help this person so that, you know, they may want to build a relationship with me and maybe we could do work together or something like that. Excellent. 18 million bucks. What was the capital stack on this deal? What was the actual like... (laughs) 
idea of what the capital stack would be on this from a debt to equity standpoint, because you got the earnest money thing over the hurdle. It sounds like you had additional money you had to put into this deal due diligence wise and all that stuff. So kind of walk us through that. Yeah. So I somehow convinced my attorneys to wait on getting paid for all their work until closing. Mm -hmm. I think that I paid for the surveying as we went. There were some other things that I just had to pay out of pocket. Of course, those got paid back at closing. Mm -hmm. But we raised $10.8 million in equity from investors. And we did the rest in debt. And we did that very intentionally because if we had less debt, I mean, one, it de-risks the deal. Mm -hmm. Although it makes your immediate cash on cash returns lower. Mm -hmm. But we knew that we'd be able to start making cash distributions immediately, mm -hmm. which, of course, investors always appreciate. So with the way that the deal structured, we knew that it's not going to be a long-term cash flow play. We're not here to just sit on 5 and 6% returns. This is a master development plan. And we've gone through the planning phase, and now we are selling off individual parcels. So once we start closing on those parcels being sold, the first tranche is going to go back to the investors. And we're going to pay them back their preferred returns. And then we'll get to participate as the general partners in that portion. That is surprising. $10 million. That is like a huge, like, that's like a Mount Everest for a raise, on, like a raise on a deal for like, you know, this early on in your career. How did you do that? That's a good question. I, I found a capital partner that could. <laughs> so... I mean, if I had to go out and raise $10 million myself, not a chance I would have been able to pull it off. The, the biggest raise I've ever done solo was $4 million. And, mm -hmm. you know, $10.8 million is a totally different beast. And that's why I knew going into this project, okay, you're not going to be able to do this with a 506B syndication. You've got to go out and find a group that has some serious investors. And that's what I did. So fortunately, they ended up bringing all of the capital and the debt to the table. I didn't have to worry about that. Now, I had to do all the work on the front end to convince mm -hmm. them that it was worth bringing equity and debt to the table. But but outside of that, fortunately, I just got to lean on them. And, and that's a great relationship. Like, that's how I try and structure all of my deals now is, you know, hey, I'm the acquisitions and the execution guy. We'll find the project and we'll run the day to make it a successful project. I just want to find a partner for every single deal that we do that handles the debt and equity side of things. And those relationships have worked out very well because... We kind of have the opposite problem that, that most investors have, which is we have too many deals. We have way too many deals compared to the amount of capital that we can raise. So a lot of them, you know, I'm having to turn away. Uh, whereas most investors, they're like, we've got too much cash from our investors. We don't have the deal flow. So it, it makes a pretty good partnership. And, and that's what I'm trying to do moving forward is just more of that style of deal. Very smart. I mean, focusing on your lane. I do both now. I raise the equity and also the capital right now. I think if I was to have to raise two million bucks in capital, I could probably do it pretty short, pretty you know, pretty short amount of time. But above and beyond that, I mean, I'm going to need some help. I mean, there's like a 1,200 unit multifamily deal that I'm looking at that's going to be probably like 130, 140 million, and uh, two million bucks isn't going to cut it. So that's where I have to look into. And I've been building relationships with co-general partners, which all they do is raise capital. Uh, from their investors and put in those deals. So how was your structure with this uh, company? Because it sounded like, you know, was this like a private equity company that had a focus in real estate or what? So I can't go into details on the, okay. the true structure just because, the, you know, all that's private. And you know how things with the ACC get because it is a syndication. So they know they were just another real estate investment group, very similar to me, just probably 10 years ahead of where I am. So they had you know, very strong investor relations. They had a very strong track record of executing very successful deals. And so, yeah, I mean, that's kind of where they came from. Cold call, conference, where did this you know, contact come from? Oh, man, that's so like going down the rabbit hole. Like I said, I reached out to everyone that I knew pretty much mm -hmm. to figure out who they could put me in touch with. So a guy that I had done a deal with here in Nashville, we helped them convert a hotel into apartments and then we managed it for them. Mm -hmm. He knew a developer down in Austin. So he connected me with that developer. And then I talked to that developer. He connected me with a, a guy that basically raises capital for deals. And he was like, oh, you need to talk to this group. 
<laughs> so it was just a, a chain of events. And I mean, you can imagine at the time how many phone calls I was having like that, where I was like talking to one person, then they would refer me to this person, and they would refer me to this person. And so, yeah, I mean, it's kind of funny. Like uh, we had <clears throat> basically, you know, it was like the seven degrees of Kevin Bacon or whatever. Like, you know, <laughs> as long as I talked to enough people, I would find the right person. And, and it finally came to fruition. Absolutely. That's amazing. I mean, I'm laughing here because last week in our mastermind, I talked about the two walls, the wall that's behind you, the, that's you have your back against, and then the wall that's in front of you that stands in the way of your out, like your objective or destination. And me throughout my life, I was, if I was, if I have that wall, I'm looking for whatever like little crack or vulnerability that I can find that wall and just start scratching it and clawing at it until finally I can just bust through that wall. But it's one of those processes like where you just like, there's so many things that have happened in my life that have been there. And so many other people, they'll get off the phone with somebody who's like, oh yeah, you should talk to this person, which to some people is kind of like a, kind of like an F off type of thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, don't talk to me, but you actually took it and ran with it like all the way down to Alice in Wonderland's <laughs> rabbit hole. So that is awesome. That's right, man. I mean, you just got to be like juggernaut next, man. Put your helmet on and just start running head, head first through walls. And you're going to fall down a couple of times. You'll probably start crying. You're definitely going to bleed. <laughs> you just got to get up and run at the wall again. Now, let's take this like, let's just bring this to the closing table. What was the business plan on this? I know that you had some plans of like, you know, getting some parcels out of this and selling off those parcels. Did you, was this a lease up play from day one part of the business plan or Tell me about that. No, so so the business plan was, hey, we've already got this fully entitled for up to two two million square feet. So let's just master plan what this is going to look like and, and essentially turn it into a downtown shopping center for this neighborhood. And you know we're looking at four and five story buildings, whereas today it's one. So much more high density development. The biggest thing was, of course, my, my brokerage team and my property management team came on board to run the day to day. So we've been keeping at least up as tenants roll over. We've got about 34 to 36 tenants at, at any given time mm-hmm. and managing the day to day on the property so that we can keep that cash flow coming in while we are you know, working on the other plans because you got to keep paying that debt service. Right. And so, you know, we're having to work around a bunch of leases right? Because we can't just tear it down today and go ahead and develop 2 million square feet. There's some tenants that have leases through 2034 that we're having to work around. So we've kind of designed the plan to phase around those tenants so that eventually when those leases run up, we'll be able to tear the remaining buildings down and finish the project. Now, the tenant mix, what type of tenants are these? Are they your like favorites, like the you know smoke shops and tattoo parlors and pawn shops? <laughs> I make it fun of one of Tyler's posts because he's a community minded developer and uh, yeah. I'm a former broker myself. So tell me about the te- if you haven't uh, checked out that TikTok video, it's one of my favorites. But yeah, tell me about the tenant mix currently at this place. <laughs> Yeah, we had a lot of fun with that TikTok. It's so ridiculous. But I was like, you know what? I think it might resonate with someone. So let's do this. <laughs> Man, so so we, we've we got a mix that really runs the gamut, which is kind of nice. So we've got your national tenants, right? Uh, Dollar General, Dollar Tree, um, you know, a, a, a couple of others. But then we've got some really cool local businesses that have been there for a while. Garden Fresh, which is a, a grocery store that focuses on the Hispanic community here in Nashville. It's like the best grocery store for Hispanic style foods, which I mean, my girlfriend and I go and eat there all the time. The food's amazing. It's awesome. (laughs) So we're working like most of the tenants, we don't want to be there long term, but we're trying to figure out a way to keep tenants like that in the new iteration of what this is doing. Because like you said, I mean, we're very community oriented and and minded. And I think that that matters in placemaking and building a a development that people want to go to and live in uh, is not to just whitewash everything, right? You want to keep a little bit of the character that that has always been there in that neighborhood and the tenants that serve the community, that the community loves. So, yeah, I mean, so talking about like tenant sizes, we've got everything from like a thousand square foot tenant to, you know, 20, 30,000 square feet plus uh, and everything in between. So we got local, regional, national credit tenants. And I mean, it's a very eclectic mix, that's for sure. It's a, you know, 1960s class C shopping center that hasn't really been taken care of since the 90s. So we, we stepped in and started making a lot of upgrades and changes and just making it nicer for the tenants that are there until you know we move forward with the development. 
Dude, we could talk about this deal probably for like weeks because it's a fun one. <laughs> yeah. So unfortunately, we don't have them that much amount of time, even though I love long form content. Typically, people want to listen to podcasts that are between 30 and 60 minutes. So and I don't think you have the time either. So we're going to go into live Q&A with our live stu uh, virtual studio audience. People, this is like the the Oprah show for real estate investors. OK, but <laughs> the last thing I wanted to ask Tyler was. For those, a lot of people that listen to the show are experienced real estate investors that want to bust through that ceiling and swim upstream into larger deals. What's your words of advice for them? You know, take the path that I did. When I was first getting started, I wanted to be so greedy, right? Like, oh, I've got this really good deal. I deserve 50% of it, but you bring 100% of the capital and you bring 100% of the debt and I don't have the balance sheet to sign on this and I don't have the experience, but I've got the deal. That doesn't work, right? I got 10% equity in the first project that I ever did, but I didn't have to put up any capital. I didn't have to deal with any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. I just found the deal. And then my role was to go and execute the day to day as a project manager, put some sweat equity into it. I learned more in that two years working on that development project than anybody could have ever justified paying me. Because you know, that that amount of experience has translated into what we've grown into today. And I wouldn't be here without that. So I think that there is an immense amount of knowledge that you can gain from partnering up with somebody that's been there and done that and learn the ropes from them. Maybe you're not going to have, you know, a huge share of equity in the first project that you do, but you'll get the experience, you'll get the track record, and that'll make other investors, lenders, other partners want to work with you more. Excellent. Great words of advice. Hey, we got to get going into live Q&A. So if you're listening to this out in podcast land and you want to get on the exclusive live Q&A with absolute beasts like Tyler Cobble, Gina Barbaro, Matt Faircloth, Reed Goosens, Brian Burke, Ashley Cares, and other BP contributor as well, you got to get in our live studio audience on uh, Facebook. It's the Go Big Live Real Estate Investors Group. Look us up. It is not an open group, so you got to extend a request to join. I'll review your profile, make sure you're not a scammer, and I'll let you into the group to get the value out of getting these episodes far in advance and also being able to chat with our esteemed guests. So that being said, Tyler, thanks for coming on the show, man. Absolutely.